I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute. Good evening, I am Larry Mohn, president of the Manhattan Institute. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we're delighted to be co-sponsoring this event with our friends at the Policy Exchange, one of the UK's most influential and well-respected think tanks, as well as with Larry Lindsay's Lindsay Group. The Institute has a long history with both our speakers this evening. Larry Lindsay and I first met at a conference in London in the 1980s at which Larry talked about his work on supply-side tax policy. His presentation encouraged the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Nigel Lawson, uh, to call for tax reform in the United Kingdom. And it was probably close to a decade ago that the Institute's good friend, Daniel Finkelstein, who is now the chairman of the Policy Exchange, brought a rising young star in the parliament named George Osborne to the Institute's office for a policy discussion with several of our scholars. Danny told us at the time that George Osborne was going to remake the Conservative Party and lead it back to power. And he was right. I am honored and delighted to offer some introductory remarks for both our speakers. Larry is the president and CEO of the Lindsay Group. He has held leading positions in government, academia, and business, going back to the Reagan administration. He, he has served as a governor of the Federal Reserve System, as special assistant to the president for domestic economic policy during the first Bush administration, and as assistant to the president and director of the National Economic Council during the second Bush administration. Perhaps most notably, Larry served as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors during President Reagan's first term when he helped to craft the tax policies that helped ignite the significant economic growth of the 1980s. In the late 1980s, Larry joined the Manhattan Institute as the Citicorp Riston Fellow for Economic Research, during which time he wrote the book, The Growth Experiment which is still one of the most respected defenses of supply-side tax policy to date. I am happy to report that Larry is back at the Institute, and next year we'll, we'll be publishing an update of the growth experiment for the Institute, so we're very pleased about that. Our featured guest tonight is, of course, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne. Uh, Chancellor Osborne was born and educated in London. He studied modern history at Oxford University. He worked as political secretary to the leader of the opposition before being elected as a member of parliament in June 2001. He entered parliament as the youngest conservative MP in the House of Commons. After serving on the Public Accounts Committee and holding a number of shadow ministerial posts, he was appointed to the position of shadow chancellor in 2005 at the age of 33. In 2005, he was successfully ran David Cameron's campaign to become leader of the Conservative Party. In 2010, he served as the general election coordinator for the Conservative Party's successful campaign. In May 2010, he became Chancellor of the Exchequer. He is the youngest chancellor to take office since Randolph Churchill in 1886. As chancellor, he has introduced two budgets which have tackled Britain's budget deficit and laid the foundations for economic growth. He has also undertaken far-reaching reform of the financial sector. Please join me in welcoming the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Right Honorable George Osborne. Uh, Larry, thank you for that introduction, and um, uh, thank you for comparing me to Randolph Churchill, who was uh, a truly terrible Chancellor of the Exchequer, <laughs> and uh, resigned uh, before he'd even presented a budget. Uh, and basically did one good thing, which was to produce uh, a son called Winston Churchill, uh, who went on to save the country and the Western world. Uh, the, it is, uh, it is a, uh, it's a great honor to be back here at the Manhattan Institute, back speaking under your auspices. And I, I well remember uh, my visit many, many years ago with, with Daniel. And, uh, and I've always admired, and the Conservative Party has always admired uh, what the Manhattan Institute has done. I think you're one of the most interesting and innovative uh, urban and economic policy 
uh, think tanks, and a lot of your ideas have made their way across the Atlantic. I know they've, they've uh, helped uh, shape social policy here in the US, uh, but they have also helped shape social and economic policy in the UK, uh, not just most famously uh, your uh, crime uh, policy work, but also your welfare to work uh, policy work and some of your economic thinking. And so uh, it, it is an honor for me to speak under your auspices. Uh, I'm also delighted to be here at the, I think, the launch event of the American Friends of Policy Exchange, which is a, a similar think tank, and I mean that in the best sense of the word, a, a center-right free market think tank, but applying itself to uh, social problems. In fact, I like the think tank so much, I've just hired uh, its director to come and work with me in the uh, Treasury. Uh, but uh, So there is a post going vacant there. But uh, uh, it is uh, good to do so. It's good to uh, speak also under their auspices. And I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation I'm going to have uh, with Larry later. And I've known Larry for many years. And he is one of the most brilliant economic thinkers in the world. And uh, so I'm going to have to be on my mettle for the conversation that's coming. Uh, and uh, it is a conversation, and I don't, I don't want to say very much by way of an introduction. I thought I'd just sort of set the terms of our, of our discussion this evening, but then I very much want to get into a two-way conversation. Um, I've come uh, straight from London, where uh, there was a meeting of the Cabinet this morning, uh, and I'm a member of the Cabinet, and the Queen attended the Cabinet meeting. Uh, and you might think, uh, those of you who watch uh, Downton Abbey, that... Uh, <laughs> that the Queen always comes to our uh, cabinet meetings. But in fact, this is the first time that a British monarch has attended the cabinet since 1781. Uh, so it is quite a historic uh, occasion. Uh, in the same room, same table, same chairs. Uh, so she attended. She's in her 60th Jubilee year, and she wanted to do things in this year that um, she'd never done before. And because she's the queen, she can just come and attend the cabinet. That's one of the things you can do you've never done before if you're the queen. And um, uh, she came along, and, uh, and we sat, and she just attended a normal meeting and listened to us uh, talking about uh, economic and uh, foreign policy. Uh, and I was thinking about what it would have been like sitting around that table in 1781. We, too, were waiting for news from Washington. Uh, General Washington in, in that case. Uh, geographical features were, uh, were all uh, the rage. You have the fiscal cliff at the moment. I think we were looking for Valley Forge at, at the time. Uh, and uh, we were, of course, worried about our soaring national debt, uh, which was uh, at the time uh, 100 million pounds and is now uh, about a trillion pounds. So uh, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. Um, when she attends to realize the period of uh, our history that she's been our monarch and she met Franklin Roosevelt and she's met every president since then. Uh, and when you look at our economic situation, uh, it is in, in many ways unprecedented even in her lifetime. Uh, the situation that the West faces, the, the combination of uh, the banking uh, crash and the recovery from that, the problem that a lot of Western countries have of these uh, high deficits and rising debt and the problem of low growth, uh, and then the challenge of, uh, of the structural change in our world economy, uh, the structural change that has seen uh, economic power shifting uh, primarily to the east, to Asia, but also to the south. Uh, and the question that all of us face in Western democracies, which is how are we going to rise uh, to all these challenges? L let me say something very briefly about how we're approaching the, the problem and then uh, get into a discussion with you about that. Uh, it, I would like to focus really on the th three pillars, the three uh, elements of our response. I mean, the first is a monetary response. Now, I'm not directly responsible for monetary policy in the United Kingdom in the sense that we have an independent uh, central bank that sets interest rates, uh, although the mandate uh, against which they operate, the inflation target, is set by the government uh, and the chancellor. Uh, and the governor is appointed by the uh, Chancellor Exchequer, and I've just appointed the governor of the Bank of Canada to be the next uh, governor of the Bank of England uh, starting next summer. But we, uh, the country has been running through the Bank of England and, and in, in occasion uh, in cooperation with the Treasury, a very uh, accommodative monetary policy, very low interest rates like you have here in the United States, uh, quantitative easing programs and asset purchases, uh, and also uh, 
innovative lending schemes uh, to ensure that, uh, that uh, credit uh, flows in the economy. And we have a funding for lending scheme uh, operating at the moment to try and uh, temper the deleveraging of the British economy. Uh, that, that, uh, that very accommodative monetary policy would have seen uh, completely uh, extraordinary 10 years ago, uh, but is now uh, absolutely essential, we would argue, to the um, underpinning of what we're seeking to achieve, and it, and it helps uh, support demand. At the same time, we have a, a tough but credible uh, fiscal policy. And uh, we have a challenge in the United Kingdom, rather like you have a challenge in the United States, of a high budget deficit. Uh, we don't have the luxury of a reserve currency, which uh, you do, uh, which uh, gives you a little bit more time than it gave us to uh, address our problems. And in 2010, when this government came to office, the government I'm part of came to office, interestingly enough, in a um, hung parliament situation, there was no majority. Uh, again, a, not a unique situation, but a situation the country had last faced in peacetime in the 1930s. So uh, certainly a challenge for politicians uh, at, the, at that moment. We put together a coalition government and we set out a, a credible fiscal plan to deal with a budget deficit that stood at 11.5% of our national income. Uh, and we uh, at the time were borrowing money at the same uh, rate as Spain. Uh, and over the last uh, couple of years, that plan has taken effect, uh, and we have stuck uh, rigorously to it. And it has reduced that uh, deficit from about 11.5% to just under 8%, uh, and is set to continue to fall uh, over the coming years. Uh, it's a multi-year plan. Uh, it is now extended to 2017. It is balanced between tax rises and spending cuts. Uh, and entitlement reform. Uh, and the balance is roughly 80% uh, spending cuts or entitlement reform, 20% uh, tax rises. And I think we uh, have got the balance right. And we did some work to look at interna internationally what, what consolidations have worked elsewhere in the world and what the balance was. And I think if you look elsewhere in the world, people who've tried to do it without any tax uh, measures uh, have found that difficult. Uh, and those who have put too much emphasis on tax have, uh, uh, have potentially had an impact on the competitiveness of their economy. So we have an 80-20 mix of uh, spending, uh, spending cuts to tax increases. We've tried to avoid um, economically uh, damaging uh, cuts or tax rises. So our uh, tax rises have uh, primarily been a consumption tax rise. Uh, I mean, no tax increase is an easy thing to do, but I think uh, the consumption tax rise, VAT as we call it, was probably the, the most economically sensible uh, approach. Uh, and our spending cuts have focused, as I say, uh, largely on, uh, well, or a significant component of them have been entitlement changes. And we've tried to protect, for example, government spending on science, government spending on transport infrastructure, uh, government spending on education. Uh, we have sought to be fair. This is the most controversial uh, area for any uh, politician at the moment, trying to show people that you're doing this in a way that is fair, but we have tried to make it fair across the income distribution with those in the uh, top deciles uh, making a greater contribution as a percentage of their income than those in the uh, lower deciles. Uh, and uh, that has been something which we felt is, is an important thing uh, to help us uh, uh, bring the public with us in these uh, changes that we're bringing about. A and we've sought to combine uh, credibility with flexibility, which is, you know, of course, uh, always a challenge, but I think we've achieved it. Uh, credibility, because we are now borrowing money at uh, the lowest rate that anyone doing my job for the last 800 years has been able to borrow money um, and continue to do so, but also flexibility that we've allowed the automatic stabilizers to operate we are not trying to balance the budget every year. We're just trying to uh, keep that, uh, keep on the path of making sure the structural deficit is coming down, the deficit's coming down, uh, and that we are getting the public finances uh, uh, under control. Uh, and indeed, uh, there are some um, quite um, striking similarities, actually, with the plan that we've set up and the plan independently arrived at by uh, the Simpson-Bowles uh, uh, Commission. Uh, not. Not exact parallels, but uh, there are some striking similarities. Uh, 
there is no doubt that, uh, in my mind, that we've made progress. We've made progress, as I say, on the deficit. Uh, employment and unemployment have done much better than we had hoped and forecast, actually, uh, two years ago. Our unemployment has continued to fall uh, to below 8% now. Uh, employment is at a record high in our country. Uh, and uh, although jobs have been lost in the public sector, in the, in the state-funded sector, uh, they have been more than uh, made up for jobs created in the private sector, and that has been all well and good. But there's no doubt that the GDP uh, data has disappointed, has not been what we had once forecast. Uh, and we have an independent forecaster. One of the decisions I took very early on was to hand over forecasting to an entirely independent body. So I don't make the economic forecasts of the country anymore. The Treasury doesn't make those forecasts. We have a, what we call an Office for Budget Responsibility, which is a sort of version of the Congressional Budget Office, but, but empowered to make the official forecasts for the country. Uh, and they have uh, looked carefully at the reason why GDP is disappointed. Uh, of course, we're not the only country where this has been the case. Uh, they have come to the conclusion that it is not because of the fiscal consolidation, that they that, that was taken into account in their original forecast two years ago. They have not changed their fiscal multipliers. Uh, but they've come to the conclusion that the deleveraging and the recovery from the um, banking crisis is taking longer uh, than anyone hoped. Uh, and, of course, that is an analysis that is very familiar with those who've uh, read to the uh, Ken Rogoff's work and Carmen Reinhart's work. They are also uh, not unreasonable in pointing out that uh, we have got uh, some significant problems on our doorstep in the Eurozone, which is the source of 40% of our exports. And um, one of the uh, paradoxes of, of, uh, of uh, the European economy over the last decade or more is that Germany actually became less integrated with the Eurozone uh, even though it was uh, right at the heart of the Eurozone, uh, and uh, established its uh, new markets in China and the like, whereas the UK became more integrated with the Eurozone, even though we weren't part of it, uh, because we became the, the big financial centre for the Eurozone. And that's a challenge for us now, as the Eurozone uh, has its problems, uh, and it's one of the things we're determinedly trying to change in terms of the pattern of uh, British trade. But I would say I, I think we end the year... Uh, a little bit more optimistic that there is a determination in the Eurozone to confront their problems and to do what is necessary. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I think it was an open question about whether uh, actually uh, all members of the Eurozone wanted Greece to remain in. I think it's pretty clear by the end of the year that they do want Greece to remain in, uh, and they've taken some considerable steps to achieve that. Uh, of course, the challenge now is the delivery of that policy, but I don't think anyone now doubts uh, their intention. Uh, and of course, there is then the uh, challenge, the short term challenge you have in the US with the uh, fiscal cliff, which is probably the most immediate uh, short term risk to the global economy. But uh, as, uh, as I say, with um, uh, learning our history and being in that cabinet room where the, uh, uh, the cabinet met in 1781, I'm, I trust to the uh, ingenuity and resourcefulness of the American people in resolving. Uh, that problem over the coming uh, weeks uh, and maybe months. Uh, the final thing I'd say is that in, d in doing all of this, uh, there's been a lot of focus on our uh, fiscal program and our deficit reduction program, and, and that's the thing that attracts the most political heat in Britain and probably the most interest in, in other countries. I would just say alongside that, we are uh, undertaking what I would argue is pretty far-reaching structural economic reform to deal with that other thing I was talking about, which is the structural shift of uh, economic power in, and wealth in, in this world. Uh, we have aggressively reduced our corporation tax rate from 28% to 21%. That is a clear choice to make at a time when, you know, frankly, politically, it might have been easier to put up taxes on business than to increase consumption tax. But uh, uh, we are doing the opposite. We are trying to make the UK tax system uh, aggressively competitive and certainly we now have the lowest rate uh, of any of the major Western economies in the world. Uh, we've also taken the decision to tackle the uncompetitive uh, high rates of personal tax. Again, this has been controversial, of course, uh, but uh, I inherited a 50% rate of income tax, which had been put in place 
uh, one month before my arrival by my predecessors. Uh, and we have uh, taken that tax rate down to 45%, which puts us uh, you know, roughly on a parallel with, for example, if you include state taxes, New York and California, or indeed many other European countries. But I didn't think it was uh, really sustainable for the United Kingdom to have a 50% rate of personal income tax. And indeed, our independent body said it wasn't raising uh, very much money uh, as a result. Uh, we are also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, undertaking major entitlement reform, welfare reform, uh, getting rid of a whole series of benefits and creating a single benefit where, uh, with, a, uh, with a low taper rate so that it always pays to work that extra hour, which is not the case in our current system. We're undertaking uh, education reform with uh, some inspiration from various states, uh, including this city, which have undertaken charter school reform and, and doing something uh, quite similar in the UK. Uh, and, and in higher education, we're making uh, reforms that mean that students contribute more through student loans, and that will help us uh, retain one of the jewels in the crown of the British economy, which is our universities, which alongside American universities are among the best in the world. We've got more to do uh, on energy. We are investing in sustainable energy, but I would like to see us uh, do more on shale gas and unconventional gas, and I, I, I see with... Uh, with admiration what uh, happened in the United States and the way that uh, your uh, shale gas revolution uh, is uh, made a substantial um, uh, contribution to your economic performance over recent years and, and is going to change things quite considerably in the future. Uh, and uh, of course, we need to do more, uh, as I was saying, to expand British trade to uh, countries like uh, China and Indonesia and Vietnam and India and so on. I think we have one, and I'll end on this, one great advantage, uh, which is we're a very open country. And I'm always struck as someone who grew up in London. Uh, I can see how even in my city, uh, over my lifetime, uh, we have become a truly open place, uh, open to companies coming to invest, open to people coming to do business. Uh, and that is something which not many Western democracies can say at the moment. There is no protectionist argument in British politics. Uh, on the left or the right. It is just doesn't feature in British political discourse. That is a great uh, advert for our country, and it enables to say to uh, American investors and, and other investors around the world, come to Britain. Britain is open for business. And in that big uh, existential question we all face, which is in this global race, confronted with the question, are you prepared to do what it takes to stay competitive, to continue to provide for your population a, a decent standard of living, uh, our answer is in the uh, do or decline question that we will do whatever it takes. Thank you very much. I, um, there, there is a, a piece of good news for the members of the fourth estate. We had uh, planned uh, that this would be um, off the record and uh, the chancellor has uh, graciously agreed to have this be on the record. And so um, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I hope you won't come to regret the decision, but uh, um, uh, Chancellor Osborne has uh, had uh, a very distinguished career. I've had the privilege of knowing him uh, for, for quite some time, and um, I'm going to start the, the grilling, if I may, with uh, the structure that you actually laid out. Um, and if I just may ask you uh, to begin with about the fiscal policy, Britain is unique in the world. Uh, we all know in theory that what we're supposed to do is get our fiscal house in order, and then when that is done, then we can have the monetary authority do what it has to do. Why is Britain unique in that regard? Why is no one else following that path? Well, I, well I'm not sure I uh, accept the premise of the question, if that's not a bad way to start. I mean, the, uh, I, mean I, would, I would say that even in the US, although, you know, you, you, I'm, I'm not going to tread on, on American toes here, a lot of American states have been consolidating and yes. uh, trying to get their finances in order. And of course, in, on the continent of Europe now, there are a number of pretty ambitious deficit reduction programs in place. Indeed, some of them are positively you know, um, um, uh, don't allow the automatic stabilizers to operate. They're, they're, ver they're very aggressive programs. It's true that when we put the plan in place, we were outliers. Uh, we were the first major country in the world to set out a plan. But as I say, I feel two years later, 
that quite a lot of other have got quite a lot of other countries doing something similar. Um, I, I just felt you're a new government. We were a new government. We had to make use of the fact that we had a the political honeymoon to do something uh, about the very significant deficit problem we had as a country. We were running alongside the United States, the one of the very highest deficits in the world. As I say, we didn't have a reserve currency. Uh, we were also in a hung parliament situation. People did not know whether the British political system had the capacity to put in place a program. Uh, and at that very moment that we came to office, we also had problems just beginning to emerge in the Eurozone that were beginning to, you know, the beginning of a sovereign debt cr uh, crisis on the European continent. So for all those reasons, we, had to, we felt we had to act fast and decisively. We've done that. It's, I'd say it's been controversial. It's, it's certainly been the subject of the, you know, of the debate in British politics for the last two years. What's striking is the British public have been actually pretty supportive of the program. And if you ask the British public, even today, two years on, they are pretty supportive of the idea that we've got a debt problem, we've got to deal with the debt problem. You, you mentioned uh, the political arrangement, and I, I want to make this mostly about economics, but what you call coalition government, mm. we call divided government. Um, do, yeah. do, are we not seeing the divisions that actually take place in the cabinet? Are you something less yeah. than a, a happy band of people? Or? Well, I, you have to imagine a, uh, we're, we are a, I think, a pretty strong government. Um, the, you have to, the British system, I can give you my, the way I explain the British system to, Amer to Americans. You've got to imagine you just have the House of Representatives um, and, you, and the Speaker is the President and the Majority Leader is the Chancellor, is like the Treasury Secretary and the, uh, the Majority Whip is the Secretary of State and so on. So all the members of the Cabinet are members of Parliament, elected members of Parliament with their own constituencies or districts as you call them. And... Uh, and so you, don't, you can't have in the British system, uh, by definition, a situation where the majority leader, in effect the, the speaker, uh, doesn't have a majority because they wouldn't be they wouldn't be the prime minister if they couldn't have a majority. So we don't we we never have that situation that you have in the U.S. But the general election had thrown up a, as I say, the, for the first time since the 1930s, a, a situation where no one party had a majority, and in that situation it was assumed that a party would, that the largest minority party, which would have been us, the Conservatives, would have attempted to form a government and try and construct a majority for each vote. But in fact, we took a different decision, which was to uh, make an offer to the third party that held the balance of power, uh, the opportunity of coming into coalition with us, a full-blown coalition where they took seats in the cabinet, where their leader became the deputy prime minister. Uh, and two and, a, two and a half years on, that arrangement has held and it provides for collective decision making and a cabinet that can operate and take very difficult decisions. Now we fall out over some things, uh, which you know, if you were an aficionado of British politics, you would, you would know the ins and outs of. So you know, uh, we have an argument about um, press regulation or an argument about the constituency boundaries. Or, but the, on the really big issue of economic reform, the government has been remarkably united and indeed um, just a couple of weeks ago, I set out a pretty another difficult set of decisions on entitlement reform and, uh, and tax, and that that is something that commands the majority support in Parliament because the coalition can deliver it. So, I think that's been one of the strengths of British politics the last two years, and certainly one if we'd been here two years ago that I would have said, you know, at least people would have had questions about. Do you think it's helped focus your mind? meaning the mind of the government. Do you think it's easier, actually, to get broad public support if you have that kind of, uh, of coalition situation, or would it have been easier just to have the majority yourself? Well, I think it helps that um, you have two political parties that have come together um, and have sort of a shared analysis of the problem and, and, the, and of the solution. Uh, and the, the third party is a, is a sort of center, center leftish party. We're a center right party, so it's, we span the political uh, divide in that sense. Um, so, I, yeah, I think it has helped. Um, it's, it, I think the alternative, which is, you know, I would not know uh, whether I had a, a, the majority for each one of my 
spending decisions or each one of my tax decisions and would have to put that together for every vote, which I know is absolutely par for the course in the United States and is what you're used to. In the British context, I think would have been exceptionally difficult. Uh, and I'm not sure how long, uh, frankly, a government could have survived uh, with that situation. Uh, you mentioned you've uh, cut uh, the deficit by three points in about two years, or point and a half a year, roughly. Uh, that's the pace you look forward to in the future as well, it looks like. Well, it, it, it partly depends on the um, economic environment. Uh, so we, we are allowing the automatic stabilizers to uh, operate. And I, you know, I took a too difficult decision two weeks ago. I had set as a target that we would get uh, debt as a uh, percentage of national income falling uh, in the year 2015-16. And I had to say, well, it's going to take a year longer than that. Now, I could have chased that debt target down. That would have required more uh, pro-cyclical cuts, if you like. And I didn't think that was the right decision. And actually, I think that was, that, that's that been well accepted by, the, by investors and by the political system. Um, so the pace of deficit reduction can vary depending on the economic circumstances. But the, what we're, but where we rest the credibility is the actual changes we've made. We've changed entitlement, so that's making a change. We've changed the budgets of different departments. And uh, so we're making structural changes to the cost of the British state. And the cost of the British state had grown to around 48% of our national income when I came to office. And the plan is by the end of the, the, the period, it will be 39%, which is much, much closer to where the uh, long-term British average is. Uh, you pointed out uh, you had a less than hopeful experience or useful experience raising your top rate of income tax from 40 to 50. Um, just to be clear for the press and for the audience, was this um, was it the policy exchange that did that calculation? Who actually did the calculation <laughs> that it didn't pay off? Well, the, the tax rate was, we had a 40% rate of tax, which had been in place since uh, the 1980s. Nigel Lawson, right. who Larry mentioned. Uh, and, um, and then the last year of the, 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 the previous Labor government, they increased it, that rate from, in two goes. So they first announced it was going to be 45%, and then they announced it was going to be 50%. And that rate, that 50% rate, came in with just a month, um, with just a, a, a month before the general election. Um, now, the Inland Revenue, our, or IRS service, uh, what we call Her Majesty's Customs and Revenue, um, they had, uh, they have shown. First of all, there was there's been a huge amount of forestalling, so a lot of um, income was lost as people made sure they were paid in the year when they were paying 40% tax rather than 50% tax. Uh, and, um, and there was a fairly dramatic num reduction in the number of people declaring incomes of over a million pounds. Uh, so we've taken a, a difficult decision, a politically difficult decision, to cut the rate from 50% to 45%, uh, which is still higher than it was for all those years. Um, and uh, the, our independent forecaster, so the independent Office for Budget Responsibility, which is totally independent of the government, uh, has estimated that the cost of doing that, in terms of revenue foregone, is around £100 million, which is a very small sum in the British context and, and, and indeed the American context. So uh, they, they think it has such a perverse effect and uh, is, is so discouraging that the cost of cutting one of the income tax rates by 5% is, is very small and indeed might be outweighed by... Um, uh, actually um, revenue gains elsewhere on things like consumption tax. All right. Just to put it in the American context, your independent commission has concluded that the maximum point of the Laffer curve is somewhere in the high 40s. Yes. Does anyone from the New York Times here? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, 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 I'm not I, getting I, into the... I uh, not, George. <laughs> I, 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 I set you up, and I apologize. <laughs> no, for no, that. I. Uh, but but I, I ask it in a factual way, and we're just we're just we're reporting all the news that's fit to print, and, <laughs> and, and, and not necessarily just the news that fits their tint. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> monetary policy. Yes. Uh, you um, had a terrific, terrific uh, appointment. Now, there's some editorializing on my part. Yeah. Um, 
how did you pull it off? Was it hard? I mean, here you're getting uh, a, a colonial, I guess, or whatever. Um, I know. Is that what you call the Canadians? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I figured that's what you call the Canadians. We, right. We, we, all of our Tories went up there uh, 200 years ago. But um, first of all, was it awkward to appoint a non-British national to be head of the central bank? Mm -hmm. And um, why did you look outside the country? It was a great decision, I'll yeah. preface it. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, in my job, you've got to obviously get certain decisions right. Uh, but one of the ones you've absolutely got to get right is the choice of your next central bank governor. And, and in our system, that is very much, but it's my choice, by, by convention, it's my choice, uh, which is recommends it to the prime minister, who then recommends it to the queen, who, uh, who makes the appointment. Um, and so I was very focused on getting the best possible person for the job. And we had some excellent candidates in Britain. Uh, but I had come across Mark Carney on the international circuit, uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada. He's also chair of the Financial Stability Board, which is the, you know, the international uh, group that uh, looks to coordinate uh, financial regulation. Uh, and he had struck me as someone who uh, ticked all the boxes uh, so he had he had real economic credibility. Uh, he had uh, the knowledge of financial regulation. And of course, one of the big jobs of the, of the uh, Bank of England governor is to regulate the city of London, which is the, you know, with New York, one of the world's two great uh, financial centers. Uh, he also had private sector experience. Uh, and uh, he also had proved, proven at the Bank of Canada that he was a very good manager of the bank in terms of just being a good person at administering the bank. Uh, so for all those reasons, I thought he was a very attractive candidate. Uh, I approached him earlier this year, in uh, the beginning of this year, and to ask whether he was interested in the job. And um, he, he, his first, his initial reaction, having thought about it, was that he didn't want to do the job. So he did say publicly he didn't want to do the job. But then, uh, in the, as you would call it, say, in the fall, in the autumn, uh, I approached him again and this time he was interested. He applied, we had an open application process, and he sent in his CV and did an interview. We, we managed to get him to fly to London and do a interview with me and get him back on the plane without anyone noticing. Uh, so, um, so he went through the same process as everyone else, but I, th I thought he, he had all the right qualities. The, the, the final point, I, I had to keep the decision completely secret. Indeed, the first time it, anyone uh, knew who was gonna be the uh, next Bank of England governor was when I announced it to the House of Commons. It was quite extraordinary that it didn't leak, actually. Um, and I didn't know, therefore, what the reaction would be to the fact that we were appointing someone who wasn't a British citizen. Uh, and I obviously tested it out with a very small group of people, like the Prime Minister. But, um, <laughs> but, they, but it was a, t a tiny group, and, and that was the unknown, actually. We didn't know what the reaction was going to be, and I didn't know what the reaction was going to be. Uh, but it was instantly positive, and, and to the credit of, the, of our main opposition, the Labour Party, they immediately supported the decision. Uh, so we, we didn't have it. We, we had a surprising, you know, in a good sense, lack of controversy about that. I think it, it says a, a lot about Britain, that we are very open to people coming in and, uh, and, and working in our country and doing uh, top jobs like that. Um, and I think, it all, you know, I think it is also fair to say that the fact that he was Canadian uh, you know, there are a few countries which we are particularly close to, Canada being one, and, uh, and I think that helps as well. Do you expect that uh, monetary policy will change significantly? I think you need to get Mr. Carney to uh, come and uh, address the uh, Manhattan Institute. Um, I think look, he's, um, he, he, he hasn't said anything about British economic policy. He's still the central bank governor of Canada and will remain so uh, until the end of May. Um, and he will come for a, not a confirmation hearing uh, in the American sense, but he will come and speak to our Treasury Committee in Parliament in uh, probably in February. And, uh, and that's when he's going to talk about British economic policy. But he has given a speech recently um, about uh, what he's done at the Bank of Canada in terms of what he, would just, what he calls guidance about long-term interest rates, uh, the, long, the, the medium-term path of interest rates rather like the Federal Reserve has done. Uh, and, and he's opened up this question uh, about the um, inflation targeting regime, 
which is the responsibility of the national government. To which my answer is, uh, well, first of all, I'm all for having a debate about that. I, you know, I, I don't think we should, uh, after all that's happened in the world economy, not allow a debate about monetary policy regimes, and it's a debate taking place here in the, in the States and in many other countries. Uh, second, we've, we have this inflation targeting regime that's been in place since the early 1990s. Uh, I think there is quite a high hurdle from moving from that regime. You'd want to be very clear that the benefits of moving uh, outweighed the cost of moving. So anyone who wanted to establish the case for moving would have to prove that. Uh, and then the, the final part thing I'd say is I think it's one of those areas where uh, the debate is best led by uh, academia, uh, you know, the economic community, and and the, and it, you know, and, the, and governments can follow in the wake of that and see how that debate pans out. You know, the inflation targeting debate had taken place for many many years before it was became you know institutionalized in various central banks, and uh, the you know, debates about things like nominal GDP targeting, you know, they are they're only just really starting, so. Let's see how that debate takes shape. But you know what the Fed has done is, is also very interesting. I'm tempted to turn the tables if I'm allowed and ask Larry what he thinks about targeting unemployment. But uh, that would be... Uh, <laughs> You'll have to invite me to London. <laughs> the, uh, um, uh, as a uh, one last monetary policy question, and which is a segue, um, it was actually a labor government which um, was very firm about not joining the euro um, is there any controversy in Britain today about that decision? Uh, none whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, in the in the late 1990s and early early 2000s. It was the the biggest issue in British politics about whether to join the single currency, um, and uh, and it really divided uh, it divided the political system. It divided the business community. And at one point, you had the, the employers' organization, the, the CBI, what we call the Confederation of British Industry, the trade union movement, and the prime minister at the time, Tony Blair, all wanted to join. Um, but then you had people who didn't want to join, including Gordon Brown, who was the Labour Chancellor, the Conservative Party. So it, it, it split British um, politics and British public life. I would say these days, it will be very difficult to find someone uh, in any kind of prominent position who would want to, to join the euro. And of course, one of the, um, well, there, there are two hurdles. One is a, there is a referendum you'd have to win. All, everyone was, all parties are committed that uh, you'd have to have a referendum. So you'd have to persuade the public as well. And then uh, one of the, I think, um, as yet little observed consequences of the euro uh, crisis is that they've created a bailout fund to which you have to subscribe capital um, so the first thing you'd have to do to persuade your public on joining the euro is to send a whole load of money into some European bailout fund, which uh, when I speak to some of the finance ministers of non-euro countries who one day aspire to be members of the euro, they do point out this is a significant additional hurdle in any <laughs> referendum battle. Well, you, uh, you use the with typical British understatement the phrase uh, uh, to describe Europe, a problem at our doorstep. Uh, which I thought was right. To what extent do you think Europe is dragging Britain down right now as far as your economic growth goes? Well, I mean, it, there is no doubt that it is having a significant drag effect um, for several reasons. One is it's our main export market, uh, so it has a direct effect in that sense. Uh, but it's also had an impact on confidence and investment decisions and had an, had an impact on our bank funding costs, although our bank funding costs have come down in the last couple of months. Uh, so, you know, it has had a, a significant effect. It's had an effect on the U.S. economy as well. Uh, and, um, you know, we are much more interconnected with the Eurozone economy than the U.S. is. So it has had those um, uh, effects, but um, you, know, you have to deal with the situation as it's thrown at you. Europe looks... Of course, we're all Eurosceptics because our ancestors left there and came here. So it's sort of a genetic issue on the well, side of the Atlantic. That's not true, actually. Uh, the, the default American position is actually uh, to be broadly in favor of a sort of you know, European uh, integration because of the Henry Kissinger question, which is, who do I pick the phone up to? So you, you, the American administrations always would like to have one phone to 
call to make rather than uh, 27. But, uh, and, and maybe what we've <laughs> learned is that even when you have one Europe, you now, instead of 27, you have 28 to call yes. uh, Bru uh, Brussels as well. But um, um, <laughs> with regard to um, uh, the way it looks Europe is moving, it looks like we might be seeing more of a multi-track Europe. Does that seem uh, likely to you? Uh, I think we already got it, actually. Um, <laughs> And I don't, think that's, um, I don't think that's something we should be uncomfortable with. I think, in a way, the real decision was taken when, when uh, 17 of the countries, or uh, I think it was 16 at the time, uh, decided to create a single currency. Now, a lot of things flow from that, as um, Alexander Hamilton understood a couple of hundred years ago, and the Eurozone have come to understand in the last couple of years. Um, but the real decision was taken to create that currency, and that, that means that there is, in that sense, a two-tier European Union. There are those member states who do not share the currency, and there are those member states who do, and those who do are having to take all sorts of steps that the, you know, the, the fledgling United States of America had to take to make that currency work. And uh, you can see it in the decisions they're taking on banking union, uh, common supervision, uh, the tentative steps they're taking towards common deposit protection and resolution, the uh, debate that is raging about the mutualization of debt uh, and the like. I mean, these are all significant decisions which Britain is not part of, and indeed, nor is Poland or Sweden or some of the other member states who aren't part of the euro. Uh, so you do have that two-tier operating. You have the two-tier operating in other senses, um, in a way that sometimes people, you know, don't, um, uh, in a sort of surprising way, for example, on foreign, and po foreign policy and defense policy, actually there's a British-French alliance because we are the two countries with the deployable army, you know, the significant deployable armies and the seats on the UN Security Council alongside the US. And, uh, and so there's more coordination between those two countries uh, in that sphere. So, you know, there's, it's, you know the, the technical term is variable geometry, but I think there is this, I think particularly on the economic front and because of the significance of what's happening, you're getting a emerging two-tier Europe. I don't think Britain should be uncomfortable with that uh, because Britain, uh, there was a, there was a uh, campaigning slogan by, by one of our party leaders who's now our foreign secretary, William Hague, and he said, Britons want to be in Europe but not run by Europe. And I think we, we can have that relationship. We can be members of the European Union, members of the single market, uh, and the like. But we do not have to sign up to the European integration that the single currency requires. Well, uh, thank you for all that. And I know uh, some members of uh, the audience uh, had expressed in interest with, with questions. I'm just going to call on people. I'm sorry. Yes, please. Yeah. The biggest, is it? Okay. The biggest division between American conservatives and British conservatives Thank you. on economic policy focuses on supply side economics. And that goes back to Alan Walters, who uh, used to argue with supply siders here in the U.S. In fact, Manhattan Institute had a piece back in 1981, a debate between George Gilder and Alan Walters as to the effect of the supply side tax cuts of the Reagan administration. Walters did not think they would bring in more revenue. George Gilder did, and of course, once the tax cuts came in in 83, more revenue began to pour in, as, as Larry will tell you. Uh, does that distinction still hold? That is, there seems to be a skepticism on the part of your government, on the part of you specifically, and the power of tax rate cuts to actually generate revenue. Is, is that distinction between economic policy still in existence? Well, I, I, I am um, more of a Thatcherite than Reaganite when it comes to um, tax policy in that sense, which is I'm a, I'm a fiscal conservative and I, and I don't want to take, take risks with my public finances um, on an assumption that we are at some point in the Laffer curve. Um, what I would say is let's see the, the proof in the pudding. In other words, um, by, I'm a low tax conservative. I want to reduce taxes, but I basically think you have to do the hard work of reducing the cost of government to pay for those lower taxes. Yeah, just like Alan Walters. Yeah. Um, and um, 
you know, I would, I would say that we have demonstrated over the last couple of years in difficult circumstances um, some aggressive reductions in tax, hence the corporation tax rate coming down from 28% to 21%. It's a big fall. Um, and uh, it may well be that in time, actually, we get more revenue in than we estimated that we've... But, uh, but I'd rather make sure that I'm taking the steps to ensure I can pay for that. And I think there is a genuine difference between the US and the United Kingdom, which is we just don't have that freedom of maneuver that you have holding a reserve currency. It is you have a, just a bit more flex with the markets than we feel we have. And uh, so, as I say, I'm, I'm, in that sense, a fiscal conservative. If you want to cut taxes, cut welfare, and cut spending, uh, and that's what I'm doing. Just one more. John Dysart, you've, uh, just on the, you've, you've taken a decision on the developing uh, unconventional uh, gas and other fossil fuels in Britain. Are you considering restructuring the tax regime to attract uh, what, frankly, are scarce industrial resources, i.e., the drilling? you know, crews and rigs necessary to develop this because it is a major industrial undertaking and it's one that has a fairly complex and finely balanced tax regime here and wherever it, it has taken place, Canada too for that matter. Mm. Um, well, the, the, the short answer is we are in the process of consulting on what the best tax regime is. Well, there is at the moment no shale, gla shale gas, uh, you know, production in the UK. Uh, the um, the exploration is just restarted, and licenses have been issued. Uh, and we, we need to get two things right. We need to get the regulation right, and we're creating a sort of single point of contact. There are a multiple of agencies that uh, would be interested in this, and we've, we're creating a single office for, for unconventional gas. Uh, and second, we need to get the tax regime right. Now, we have quite a lot of experience of, uh, of oil and gas tax regimes because of our North Sea oil. Um, but uh, the, you, we, you know, there may well be particular features of the tax regime that are appropriate for the shale gas exploration, and we're actually we're literally in the mo at the moment in the process of consulting, and I will make a decision for the in the budget uh, in March on on what that uh, tax regime should be. But people should be in no doubt that I want that uh, that that uh, exploration and that production to take place in the UK, and I am uh, truly astounded by the. Uh, energy revolution in the U.S. that has brought down your costs of energy and is, well, you know better than me, bringing back to these shores uh, industries you thought you had lost uh, some time ago. Thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, from from where we sit, without a, a true fiscal union, the the single currency seems doomed. So I guess the question is. If the single currency were to unravel, would that be catastrophic or manageable? Uh, I think it would be catastrophic and manageable. If that's, uh, <laughs> 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 that's uh, I mean, it would be uh, the uh, catastrophic in the sense that the economic impact would be uh, enormous. I think in the short term, but uh, you know, of course, we would get through it. But uh, it would be. I don't think. You know, I think there are some people who would believe that the. You know, the, the collapse of the currency would be a sort of great liberating moment. Uh, I would just say it comes with an awful lot of collateral damage. I mean, as you, you know, as people have seen over the last year and a half, the, uh, you know, when there have been problems uh, and you have elevated funding costs in Spain and Italy, and it has had a direct and immediate impact on trade and confidence in the UK and indeed uh, in the US. So uh, I think... You know, you, we, you would not, uh, the breakup of the euro would have very, very serious consequences for the, fan of the world financial system. And I'm not saying we couldn't get through those, but it would be, I think the, uh, the short term damage would be very significant. So, so, so would you favor a, a European fiscal union over a, a, a breakup of the currency then? Well, I, I've, I, my view has been uh, they need to do things to make their currency work. They need to uh, have a greater fiscal union. They need to make transfers across that union. They need to uh, make sure that they have a banking union so that 
a Spanish depositor doesn't take their money out of a Spanish bank and put it into a German bank. They need to do all these things. And, they, and to be fair to them, they are making pretty significant steps in this direction. They are sovereign nations, nations that have existed for hundreds of years in some cases, uh, with uh, parliaments and constitutions and traditions. It, you know, it's much easier said than done just creating a, uh, a fiscal and banking union. Uh, but they, they have made significant progress. They've, stu they, they've still got a, a further to go. Um, but I think that is preferable to, um, to the breakup of the currency. And from a British point of view, I mean, British foreign policy for many hundreds of years was based on divide and rule on the continent of Europe. Um, and we, you know, we, never, we, we were always trying to achieve a balance of power in, on the continent of Europe. Actually, I think we should be... Uh, you know, we should accept that to make the currency work, they're going to integrate further. Um, and as long as we're not involved in that, I think that is, that's fine. <laughs> One last question. Hi, uh, Steve Pearson from Element Capital. So in your opening remarks, you were contrasting employment at a record high, but GDP growth very anemic, disappointing. And that's obviously the UK productivity puzzle. Have you got any thoughts on whether that's um, a crisis legacy or is that a cyclical shortfall of demand? Because uh, it's rather important as to the judgments the OMB make about your structural budget deficit, the conduct mm. of monetary policy, et cetera. Um, well, I think um, the, no, so, I mean, that's a good question. The, the, the independent uh, Office for Budget Responsibility has really said it's a bit of both, is the answer to your question. I mean, they, they made an assessment a year ago that the, the banking crash, uh, you know, which was obviously enormously significant in the US, but also enormously significant in the UK, and the biggest bank bailout in the world was a British bank, the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, that, um, you know, that, that, had, that was having a longer lasting impact, and you know, it was pot potentially uh, led to semi-permanent changes in the structure of finance, and there are now questions about the allocate, you know, whether there's an efficient allocation of credit going on and the like. Um, at the same time, uh, there because of the problems in the eurozone, there has been a cyclical um, hit over the last year. Indeed, the, the the downgrade of our GDP forecast for this year, the has the OBR assessed to be entirely down to the eurozone. Um, so, I, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, there is there is something of a productivity puzzle. Um, I think it will sort of come out in the wash. But I, I, th I think the, um, the, I mean, the interesting thing is, if you're if you're in my job, almost every single piece of data is a survey of some kind, except for how much unemployment benefit I have to pay every week, uh, and the tax revenues I collect every week. I mean, those are two real bits of data, and the. Um, uh, what, you know, what I would say is it is striking that the claimant count has fallen. Uh, and it's striking that although, um, you know, tax receipts, in, like tax receipts from the North Sea have been weak over last year, tax receipts from banks are much lower than they were five years ago. But broadly speaking, there has not been some dramatic fall in our tax receipts over the last year. Uh, so, you know, those two real bits of information suggest that look, while times, you know, could be better, they also could be a lot worse. George, I want to thank you. And you know, on behalf of an American audience, I think many of us wish that our leaders were as candid and as knowledgeable about a broad range of subjects as uh, you have been tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.